as we continue to look up to ascend with the psalmists in the pilgrimage of faith, to build up our prayer language in dialogue with the human and divine aspects of God, Psalm 123 will guide the posture of our hearts. This plea draws attention to the corporate identity of God's people as his servants. From this place, submission to God, we petition him for mercy. As we will see, this is not the kind of shriveled begging a beaten slave directs to his cruel master. This is the kind of patient expectancy a royal servant gives to his king. Let's read the NIV. I lift my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven, as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. This psalm opens with the use of perspective to help the psalmist paint the posture of his heart. I lift my eyes. The posture is reverential, gazing upward at the one who dwells in the heavens. He or she fleshes this out a bit more, adding the simile of servitude, as eyes of servants to the hand of their masters. These are men, or at least a group of people with men in it, as the Hebrew language defaults to the masculine and mixed company. However, the next line, as eyes of a maid servant to the hand of her queen, certainly casts the psalmist as female. At any rate, the next line serves inclusively, as the voice becomes plural. The psalmist, posturing herself as a servant of one who dwells in the heavens, is now joined by the collective a congregation of people postured as such toward God. Perhaps the psalmist cued this progression from individual to the collective at the start of the simile. Behold, it's not translated here in the NIV, but present in others like the ESV and ASV. It's a plea for God's attention, the master's attention. As if the camera lens zoomed in on one person's humble and heavenward gaze, the camera has been moving back to a choir of servant-hearted believers expressing their submissive waiting on God through this song. What is it these servant-hearted people expect from the one who dwells in the heavens, their God? They expect God's favor, his mercy, his compassion. Why would they not? This verbal form of the Hebrew Hanan is part of God's very character. To trace this expectation, we can root ourselves into the Sinai theophany like so many Old Testament authors do. Let's take a brief say, survey of a key moment in the revelation of God's character as merciful. Exodus, a narrative that begins with the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, the vast and growing 12 tribes turned nation, is found under the oppressive thumb of Pharaoh. God, through divine intervention, raises up a son of Israel from the very house of Pharaoh. Moses to deliver his people. God uses Moses and his older brother Aaron to confront Pharaoh, sending plagues to undermine the legitimacy of Pharaoh and his pantheon. Ultimately, God draws his people across the waters, leaving Pharaoh and his army in the flotsam. Now freed, the former slaves follow their God's guidance to the base of the remote Mount Sinai. There, God proposes that these former slaves find their identity in a new master. This identity is not that of lowly slave, barely considered human, as in Egypt. They are invited to be a kingdom of priests, royal representatives of the one true king, Yahweh, God. They accept, sealing their covenant in blood. However, while Moses ascends to receive further clarification on just how his people would become a kingdom of priests, the covenant people themselves rally around Aaron, pleading for an idol statue to, to worship. Aaron concedes, breaking the covenant's explicit prohibition against making idol statues of Yahweh. God responds in anger, seeing the stubborn and reckless act of covenant violation as an issue of posture. 
He says, I see this people, and behold, they are stiff of neck. The Hebrew idiom, stiff of neck, is a way of describing the obstinance of Israel. They are not postured toward God as if he were king, but as if, if he were a deity to wield, to fashion in gold, and to parade around for power. Moses, interceding, pleads for God's mercy. God limits his justified punishment of the likely, as some scholars have noted, maybe around 2 million Israelites that had come from Egypt. The Bible reports only 3,000 fall to the swords of the Levites in judgment. God also allows a plague to break out. But consider the scale. God had the covenantal grounds to end his relationship with all of Israel. But he does not. He exercises a limited judgment. One author calls this a severe mercy. So what would God do with his people? Amid the question mark that looms from the golden calf episode, he invites Moses up to the mountain with two new tablets, for Moses had shattered the others upon descending. It's kind of like being asked to bring two new wedding rings just after what appears to be a divorce. Would God end his relationship with his people? Moses wants to know just what kind of God Yahweh is. He boldly asks God to show him his glory. So God does. He passes by Moses, proclaiming his name, his reputation, the things that define him. It's about a paragraph long. Here we go. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, there's a lot to unpack in a paragraph long name, but let's just look at some key features. Notice the limitation of judgment here in the end. God does punish. He is just, but his judgment is disproportionate to his compassionate love. He is slow to anger, not angerless. He is limited in punishment, not anarchical. We must reckon with this severe mercy of God. Remember, Jesus casts himself as a judge in Matthew 25, a king who divines the fealty of his subjects. This is the one and same God, meting out justice, righting the wrongs, combing out the iniquities, the twistings of his divine image bearers. We obviously see this in light of the cross, where God the Son himself took on the judgment of the failed covenant partner and satisfied the just wrath of of God. This is a part of God's character we must not ignore. However, it is demonstrated here in Exodus and throughout Old and New Testament that God's primary reputation is loving kindness. In fact, there is a word pair, loving kindness and faithfulness, that become a shorthand for the name of God. It's all throughout the psalmist literature it's all throughout the Old and New Testament. You see, th these aspects of God, his severe mercy, his judgment alongside of his kindness and faithfulness, they're not incongruous. God isn't bipolar. These are integrated traits, a whole character of a God that when properly understood, we can exclaim along with John, that God is love. Indeed, God is love. In this Exodus name, God reveals that the first of the twin aspects of his character, Rahum and Hanan, sympathetic and merciful, that's the shorthand of his name. This is our psalmist's expectation. When they look up at God, the just and all-powerful king of the universe, they know to expect mercy. Do you pray like that? Do you anticipate mercy when you approach God? Would you be as bold as Moses and ask for it? Would you be as persistent as the psalmist and continue to look up for it? The verbal form of this word, Hanan, mercy, 
appears three times in quick succession in this short prayer. It is clear from the posture and the petition, this prayer, it takes humility. This is not a prayer for the arrogant, the self-interested, or the self-reliant. This is the prayer of a servant. This is a prayer like Christ's, who though he was God incarnate, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. At least that's what the early Christian hymn in Philippians sings. Would you be humbled in prayer? Though God is the master cast here as king or even queen of, over these servant attendees of his, he is not the source of their contempt. His yoke is not the issue. Serving him is not the heaviness they bring forth in prayer and song. It is the yoke of contempt and ridicule of the self-confident and proud. Do you feel that tension as so many psalms seem to dissect life into righteousness and unrighteousness? The psalmist acknowledges the posture of the alternative. The Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament has the first term, which in the NIV is translated as arrogant, meaning self-confident, carefree, undisturbed. The prideful way of life distorts your view of servants. You begin to heap contempt and derision upon the servant-hearted. To live as your own king, your own God, you begin to despise the nature of the true one. It's why Paul said the gospel was foolishness or nonsense to the Greeks, whose culture embraced honor and self-advancement, much like our own. When we lift ourselves up in pride, we harden our hearts, make haughty our eyes, and stiffen our necks against the fealty to the real and good king. And when we are servants, we endure the upside-down reality of human systems that reward pride, arrogance, and self-promotion. Would you dare to pray this counterintuitive, countercultural prayer to become a servant? This psalmist uses two motifs, eyes and mercy, to guide the faithful in the posture of the humble. When we view ourselves as God's servants, we learn to anticipate, to expect his sweet and refreshing mercy. As you learn to pray to God through this psalm, would you consider using imagery such as the psalmist uses? Would you approach the throne of God knowing you are welcome, knowing you are authorized to petition, to look up, but with the humility of heart that confesses that God reigns in everything, in your situation, in your family, in your own heart? Learn to pray with humility expecting mercy.